In this video, we'll be discussing how link state routing algorithms work. Let's get started. Today we'll pick up where we left off last time and look at the link state routing algorithm. As a reminder, the link state algorithm falls into the category of requiring global information about all the interfaces in the network. The full name of the algorithm is Dijkstra's link state routing algorithm. As we said, it requires global information, meaning that every single router needs information about every other router's interfaces and whether they're up or down and what they're connected to. This information is distributed via link state advertisements and so every router will receive information from every other router in the network. Once this advertisement happens, all of the routers have the same information about the state of the network. Using that information, each router can compute the least cost paths from itself to every other router in the network. And from this, it can distill the forwarding cable, mapping destinations to output ports. The process used to find these least cost paths is an iterative one as the router processes the information it has received from the other routers in the network. We'll use some specific notation to describe this algorithm, which include the cost of links between nodes, the current estimate of the cost to a particular destination, and the predecessor node along the path to the destination. We'll talk more about what the predecessor node is in a minute. And lastly, we have the set n prime of the nodes to which we definitely know the least cost path. So in this example, we're using u to represent the router that is running the algorithm. So it will be the source for all the connections, and it's computing the cost to all the possible destinations in the network. So initially, n prime, which is the set of nodes to which we know the least cost path, only contains u, meaning this router knows the cost to get to itself, which is zero. It doesn't have to traverse any links to get to itself. It will then walk through all the possible destination nodes v. And if v is directly connected to u, then u will know the cost of the link to v. That's c underscore u v. And it will use that cost as its distance to v, which might get updated later. If v is not directly connected to u, then u doesn't know how to get to v yet, so the cost to get to v is infinity. It's not reachable. That initializes our variables, and then we're going to iterate in a loop until we found the lowest cost to get to each destination. First, we look through all the destination nodes that aren't currently in n prime and find the one that has the lowest path cost. We then add that node w to n prime and we look at all the neighbors of W that are not already in N prime and update our cost to those destinations if it's lower than what we already have. If the cost we have already recorded in D is lower than the new cost, we keep our existing cost. And we just keep doing that loop over and over until all of our nodes are in N prime. That may have been difficult to visualize in pseudocode form. So here's an example. We have our sample network with U on the left side of our network graph. U needs to find the least cost path to get to every other router in the network. We've created a column for every destination where we will track the path cost and the predecessor node used to get to that destination. And then we'll step through multiple iterations and populate those columns. Step zero is our initialization step. Remember that initialization consisted of populating the cost to every node that U is directly connected to. So from the graph, we see that U has direct links to V, W, and X. So we can populate those costs. The predecessor node for connecting to each of these neighbors is u, because they are directly connected to u. y and z are not directly connected to u, and so our cost to get to them at this iteration is infinity. So now we look at the neighbors, and we need to begin iteration 1, or step 1. And we see that x has the lowest currently known cost. So we're going to add x to n prime, because there's no possible way that we could go through any other node to get to x at a lower cost than we have going directly to x. So we can add this to n prime because we definitively know that we've found the least cost path to get to x. For the rest of the iteration one, we're going to update the cost to get to other nodes based on going through x. So we'll go through each of our destinations and see if there's any change. We can get to v through x, but the cost would be 3, which is higher than our existing cost of 2. So there's no change to the cost to get to v. We can get to w through x at a cost of 4, which is lower than our existing cost of 5, and so we update the cost to get to w to be 4, and we also set the predecessor node to be x. We skip over any nodes that are already in our n prime vector, and we're now able to get to y through x. Its previous cost was infinity, so the new cost is lower by definition, and we set our cost to get to y as 2 with a predecessor of x. We still can't reach z directly from any node in n prime, so its cost remains at infinity. We then prepare for our second iteration, and we look through all our path costs, and we see that we have two destinations with a cost of two. So at that point, it doesn't matter which of those we pick, 
we can add either of them to n prime for the next iteration, but we can only add one node to n prime at a time. In this case, we're going to pick y. So now we have u, x, and y in n prime, and we're going to find out if this reduces our cost to get to any other destinations. Our cost to get to v is unchanged, but y now gives us a path to w with a cost of three. And so we update w's value, and we also update the predecessor node for w, which is now y. We skip over x and y because they're already in n prime, and y now gives us a path to get to z with a cost of four and a predecessor of y. Looking at our remaining costs, we see that v has the lowest path cost, and so we'll add that to n prime next. By the way, what we're showing down in the left is the tree that includes all the least cost paths that will be used for you to send traffic to the rest of the network. We'll see that some links won't get used because they don't fall on any of the least cost paths. However, those links might be used by other sources in the network. So now we'll see if V gives us any new reduced cost paths to any of the remaining destinations in the network. We see that V doesn't give us any reduced cost way to get to W or to Z, and so those values remain the same. We then take W and add it to N prime. However, it doesn't update our cost to get to Z. And lastly, we can add Z to N prime as well. And now we've found the least cost path from U to every destination in the network. And now we've also formed our least cost path tree in the lower left. And this is the subset of the network that traffic from U will use to get to the rest of the nodes. U can then generate its forwarding table, where it uses the link UV to get traffic to V directly, and it uses the link UX to get traffic to the rest of the network. Keep in mind that this process was run on U, and it only generated the forwarding table for U. It didn't generate forwarding tables for any other node in the network. Every node in the network needs to run Dijkstra's algorithm for itself. Let's walk through another example. Again, we have u on the left, and we start off with n prime containing u, since the cost to get to itself is zero. And we see that u is directly connected to x, w, and v. And so we can populate the cost for x, w, and v, and the cost is infinity to the remaining nodes. As before, the predecessor node to all the directly connected neighbors is u. We see that the least cost neighbor is w, so we add that to n prime, and we see what updated costs we can get going through w. And we now have a lower cost to v with a predecessor of w and are able to add the neighbor y with a relatively high cost going through w. We still can't reach z at this point. From that row, our least cost neighbor is x. And so we add that to n prime and look at x's neighbors for updates to the path costs. b doesn't connect directly to x, so no update there. And the cost to get to y via x is higher, so no update there. But now we have a path to get to z and are able to add that cost to the table. From that row, the lowest cost is to get to v, so we add that to n prime. v directly connects to w and y, but w is already in n prime, so we don't update that. However, it does improve our cost to get to y, and we can see that in a later iteration, that will also improve our cost to get to z, but we're not quite there yet. Next, we take y and add it to n prime because it's the lowest current cost in the table. And here's where we see our improvement in cost to get to z via y. Lastly, we add z to our n prime vector. As we saw in the previous example, there can be ties in this process, and at that point it doesn't matter which node is selected for the next iteration. Let's do a little analysis of the complexity of the link state algorithm. So given that we have n nodes in the network, we need to iterate n times, because we only add one node to n prime in each iteration. In each of those iterations, we check all the nodes that are not yet in n prime. So in terms of big O notation, this is an n squared complexity, although it can be optimized to be n log n in practice. So this speaks to the computational difficulty of running this algorithm on the router. We also have to consider the complexity of distributing the information needed to run the algorithm, and we call this the message complexity. Each router has to flood its link state to all the other routers in the network. So for one source, the message will need to traverse approximately n links to reach all of the other routers. And since all of the routers have to broadcast this state, we have n routers broadcasting messages that traverse n links, so it again is order n squared complexity. This algorithm becomes significantly more complex if the link costs are calculated dynamically. In particular, we have to be careful of link costs relating to traffic volume or some measure of congestion. So in this example, if we look at the traffic headed for router A, we see it's arriving from D, C, and B. And so the link between C and D is idle. If we base our link costs based on the volume of traffic, then the routing algorithm will need to adjust to use less congested links. So now each router is using its least congested path to get to A, but now this is congested different links, and this would force the routing algorithm to recompute again and find new paths, 
And so now we've flopped and are back to congesting the link between B and A. And this process will continue to oscillate indefinitely because the costs are based on the traffic and the traffic is affected by the routing choices that are made. So it's generally a bad idea to make link costs directly dependent on congestion or volume metrics. That completes our discussion of link state algorithms. In the next video, we'll move on to looking at distance vector. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.